Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Katherine Heinz from New York City Audubon, and we're going to get started in just about another minute here. We're still letting folks in. Um, and uh, we'll give that just another minute. I hope everyone is, is um, excited about tonight's talk and, and uh, as excited as I am. So let's see how that number looks. Okay. All right, it's just about 7.02, so let's get started. Um, as I said, I'm Katherine Heinz. I'm the Executive Director of New York City Audubon, and I am thrilled to be here tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for this uh, evening for our winter lecture series. Uh, and before we go further, I wanna make sure everyone knows that uh, next month's lecture by, uh, will be by Christopher Leahy, who has authored a book, Birdopedia, a brief compendium of avian lore. And he'll be joining us to discuss his book. Uh, and uh, that will be on December 6th. And um, you can look for the uh, link that Danielle is posting in the chat and also keep an eye out for an announcement in the upcoming egret email and on our website. So uh, that will be the, the talk in December. And uh, so I'd like to also offer a great big thank you to our very dear friends, Claude and Lucien Block uh, for their generous support of this series. Uh, Claude and Lucien have made this lecture series possible um, for, for many years, certainly as long as I've been here, seven and a half, or seven years, seven and a half years, and um, allowing us to bring these, these wonderful speakers to you on a variety of topics. So thank you, uh, Claude and Lucien. Uh, tonight's program is near and dear to my heart. The lecture is on the grassland birds of Fresh Kills Park. And joining us are Dr. Shannon Curley and Jose Ramirez Garofalo, and they will be taking questions at the end of their talk. So please be sure to use the Q&A function in Zoom to send us any questions that you have. So again, not the chat, use the, the Q&A function uh, to share questions um, that we'll, we'll pull from those questions as we get to the end, toward the end of the talk. Um, if you have not been to Fresh Kills, make a point of getting out there on the days when it's open. Um, it's not fully open to the public yet, but um, it was the world's largest landfill at the time it closed, and it is now an absolutely spectacular um, and amazing grassland habitat. And if you build it, they will come. Um, it's part of the green infrastructure success of our city and how uh, I was quoted in the New York Times recently as saying New York City is the, the greenest big city in the world. And I really do believe that among big, big, big cities, we are making enormous strides toward being um, embracing green infrastructure and bringing back wildlife and the foxes and the beavers and all of the birds and the many other um, animals that are returning to our habitats are, are evidence of this. And we couldn't be more pleased, but it's a process and we're not yet done with our work. And so um, I'm in, in, excited to introduce our guests who are gonna tell us more. Uh, Dr. Shannon Curley is an ecologist with the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation and an adjunct professor at CUNY College of Staten Island. She studies the effects of climate change on birds, focusing on changes in species distributions, migration patterns, and the uh, community composition. Jose Ramirez Garofalo is a PhD student in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Natural Resources at Rutgers University. His research includes uh, species distribution under climate change, grassland ecology, and the natural history of the New York City area. We are so pleased to have them both with us here tonight. So take it away, Shannon and Jose. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction, Catherine, and thank you all thank for you. coming here tonight. Um, we're very excited to share the work that's been happening at Fresh Kills Park. We're very lucky um, that we get to be a part of this process and watching this change over time. So uh, we're excited to share and uh, let me share my screen and we'll begin. Can everybody see the screen? Jose, can you see that? Yep, we're good. Okay, so um, 
We're excited to share our work at Fresh Kills Park. What you're seeing in the background here is part of East Mound that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, but as you can see, it's really just a, a work in progress and it's really quite beautiful. Um, so if you don't know about Fresh Kills Park, Fresh Kills Park is situated in this bold box here in Staten Island. And as Catherine mentioned, it sits atop uh, the former Fresh Kills landfill, which closed in 2001. And at the time, it was the world's largest landfill. Currently, it's 2,200 acres, which makes it about three times the size of Central Park. So it's a very massive park that we have. It is currently maintained by the Department of Sanitation and overseen by the DEC. And going back to that picture before, it's kind of hard to imagine that we're on a highly engineered landscape and there's a lot going on underground. Um, but what we see above ground are just these expanses of grasses. But um, we have four mounds that I'm gonna discuss uh, briefly um, that have been capped or are undergoing the capping process. Uh, which is actually quite involved. So I'm only going to give you a condensed version here and a little diagram that I have here at the bottom of the screen. So the mounds are sealed and capped with layers of soil and geotextiles. So over the, over the uh, waste layer, we have a soil barrier. We also have a gas ventilation layer, um, followed by a drainage layer. And, and within and underneath uh, these layers, we have a system of pipes, uh, wells and trenches that collect the byproducts as the garbage begins to decompose, which is then sent off to treatment plants. Um, again, we have this barrier of protection material, planting soil on top, and then it's seeded with the native seed mix. Um, and interspersed throughout the landfill, you'll see um, these well heads here, and I'll show you a picture in a little bit, um, in which gases are also monitored over time. So here you can get a layout and a brief history of Fresh Kills Park. We have South Park, which is highlighted here, which was capped in 1996, followed by North Park, which was capped in 1997. Uh, next, we have the East Mound, which was capped in 2020, uh, 2011. And this is where we see a lot of our, our grassland species and our really specialized species. And we'll talk about that and why that is in a little bit. And then the largest mound of the park um, West Mound is currently in the process of being capped and it should be completed by the end of the year. And it's just really spectacular to see this happen in real time. So if we're orienting ourselves north, south, east, and west, uh, North Park on top here, that's where we get those really incredible views of the Manhattan skyline. And you can see a wellhead that a red-winged blackbird is, is perched atop of here. And that's one of the ways that the gases are monitored in the park. Uh, below is South Park, and you can see vegetation is a little more different. You see a little bit more vegetation, um, but it, and it's really quite beautiful. Uh, East Park here is where we have the expansive grassland, and as I mentioned, this is a really large space for grassland birds to, to colonize, and they seem to really like it at this part of the park. And then lastly, we have West Mound here, which is currently in the process, and what you can see is some of the exposed soil layers here. Um, so, so this should be completed by the end of the year. So uh, we're at a bird talk. Why study birds? Um, birds are very important to our ecosystem and they're really good indicators of habitat quality. And this is because they're highly dispersive and we know that birds respond really, uh, birds respond to changes in climate and, and other processes like land use change. Uh, for example, uh, here is an example of a, a pileated woodpecker returning to NYC, if Jose would like to talk about that briefly. Uh, so as a lot of you probably know, if you're a bird or in New York City, um, really anywhere in New York City, pileated woodpeckers have always been kind of a, a treat to see. Um, certainly not annual in every park uh, or every borough um, until very recently. Um, and on the right side of the screen, you see uh, a pileated woodpecker, an adult, and a juvenile in a, a nesting uh, cavity. Uh, that is on the uh, central part of Staten Island within the green belt. Uh, and this was actually one of the first species that we started to see recolonizing New York City uh, over the course of the last five decades or so. Um, and it's now culminated with the return uh, of the species as a breeding bird. And as you'll see a little bit later, this has continued uh, with our grassland birds at Fresh Hills Park. Yeah, and as Jose mentioned, um, it's important that we monitor when we see these species moving back in or colonizing, recolonizing, 
um, because it helps us get an idea of how our management practices are working um, and how our conservation practices are working and how successful are we um, as we move along. This is particularly, particularly important for reclaimed urban green spaces because research on, on spaces like landfills that are being reclaimed um, is pretty sparse. So uh, we're using our return of wildlife as this metric for measuring our successes over the time. Um, we do have a couple different research pro uh, projects that, that uh, we conduct. They're mostly centered around bird projects, but we, we have a few that are not birds, but, and we'll briefly mention. Uh, we regularly conduct our grassland bird surveys. Uh, we have bird banding programs that we operate, including MAPS program, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more in depth. Um, and also we do grassland bird banding to look at territory use, uh, productivity, and in the future, um, getting an idea of territory sizes. Um, we're going to highlight our sedrans. That was our, our big deal bird that, that returned to fresh kills or, or started, not returned, but started breeding in fresh kills last year. And we also have a few other projects like Northern Sawwet Owl Banding that we're doing this fall and continue uh, starting a project in 2022 with Foster's Term Banding. And also what's important for uh, the habitat is what birds eat. Um, which is a lot of things like insects and arthropods. So uh, we also are going to talk a little bit about our, our arthropod sampling as well. So Staten Island has a pretty long history uh, of being kind of a destination for grassland birds. Um, unfortunately, over about 100 years or so uh, throughout the region, um, we lost most of our grassland habitat and I think we're less than 1% in the Northeastern uh, United States um, compared to what it was uh, just after European settlement. Um, but on Staten Island, at least, we historically had species like Easter Meadowlark, Bobolink, Cedron, which are always kind of a rare species, uh, grasshopper sparrows, which were probably um, in regionally high abundances on Staten Island, at least in the early 1800s, uh, as well as Vesper sparrows and nesting on the island. Um, but unfortunately, as Staten Island and really the rest of uh, New York, the New York City area in general became more uh, urban and suburbanized, most of those species started to drop off as breeders. So, you know, we lost the Cedrens in the 1940s, we lost Vesper sparrows in the 1930s, um, we lost Easter Meadowlark and Bobolink really recently, actually, uh, compared to the other species. Um, and we also lost grasshopper sparrows in the 1980s, uh, even though at one point they were at these incredibly high abundances island wide. Um, and so in the 1960s, when the Verrazano Bridge was built and uh, people started to really move into Staten Island and our population started to increase, development destroyed a lot of the grassland habitat uh, that we had, uh, namely the fields in uh, Oakwood Heights and in New Dorp, which uh, are now uh, apartment complexes. We had nesting Vespa Sparrow, Grasshopper Sparrow, Bobolink, uh, Meadowlark, and Cedra nearby. Is this you, Jose? No. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, I, I will do this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we have a couple of species that we uh, that are prevalent in the park. Savannah sparrow, which you're seeing in the upper right-hand corner, um, happens to be our most abundant species throughout the entire park. Um, but in 2015, we had the first breeding uh, records of grasshopper sparrow that were actually found um, by uh, Dr. Richard Veet of the College of Staten Island. And that year we had around 30 pairs that nested and uh, that number has been continuing since. But we're also confirming breeding of other species like Eastern Meadowlark, uh, Bobolink that you see here at the bottom of the screen and Cedra and have all bred at Fresh, Kill, Fresh Kills Park in recent years. So how do we know uh, the abundances of our breeding birds and what's occurring. Well, we conduct regular breeding bird surveys through May through August, um, and we look at our focal species. We look at savanna sparrow, grasshopper sparrow, bobolink, Easter meadowlark, and sedran, which we have to adjust the time for a little bit because they are returning to our area um, a little later in the breeding season. So 
Um, we'll talk about that as well. And what we do is we look at what you're looking at here on this figure is um, the east mound of Fresh Kales Park. And we conduct three minute point count surveys. So every dot that you see here is a three minute point count um, in which we record every bird that we see or hear. We're typically hearing um, and looking out for uh, singing males, but we will also record any type of flyovers that we get or uh, anything foraging that we see. Um, and we just go through the park evenly and we record the abundances throughout the year, uh, throughout the breeding season. We'll do this a couple different times. And what we're seeing in these two figures here is we, we started doing these surveys in 2015 and we've continued since is the trends in our savanna sparrows and our trends in our grasshopper sparrows. And our savanna sparrow population um, generally is pretty stable, although we did see a bit of a crash in 2017 through 2018. So we had very um, fewer pairs that, um, that we found there that year for reasons unbeknownst to us, we're just not quite sure. Uh, since then, we've seen this steady increase of our savanna sparrows over time. Grasshopper sparrows are also increasing. And in fact, what you can see here, uh, this year was our, we recorded our highest abundance of grasshopper sparrows by the number of singing males, which I believe is 82 or 83, Jose. I always forget that number. 82. 82. Um, so you can see that they are, they are steadily increasing over the last couple of years. We are also conducting um, nest search as well because we want to get an idea of productivity. We want to know how successful our birds are in the park. And um, what you're looking at here is four savanna sparrow eggs. And this nest is about the size of a fist. Um, they're very difficult to find. You have to um, watch the behavior of the, the parent birds feeding or going back and forth to the nest. And typically at this time in the summer, the grasses are about five to six feet tall. So you can imagine it's very difficult finding these, these eggs that are um, no bigger than a thumbnail, essentially. Uh, but within eight days, these eggs, uh, within a couple, not eight days, within a, uh, a couple days, we'll start seeing them hatch. And within eight days, they're almost ready to fledge and leave the nest. And what you're seeing here um, are the very four eggs that are pictured here are uh, four nestlings of our savanna sparrows. So uh, that's a bit of a highlight that we're incorporating into our future studies as well as recording this kind of productivity. And so one of the major undertakings at Fresh Kills over the last five years has been uh, bird banding. And so um, this was started in 2016 uh, when Dr. Uh, Richard Veet and Dr. Lisa Manna started the Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship Banding Station that we have. We'll talk about that in, a, in actually, I think one more slide. Um, and then in 2018, Shannon and I started banding our grassland birds. And so uh, for those of you that don't know, bird banding is essentially the way that we can really get measures on the health of populations of a lot of different species. And so specifically at Fresh Kills, um, we are able to uh, mark individual birds and then track them throughout the annual cycle. So before migration, we'll see, um, you know, like how much they weigh, uh, how long their wings are, are they in good body condition? So that's looking at the feather and their, and their fat content. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, and, um, and so this is done through a systematic uh, way nationwide. Um, and so uh, the Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship Network, which is run by the Institute for Bird Populations in collaboration with uh, the US Geological Survey. Uh, and it allows us to most importantly uh, estimate productivity, recruitment, and survival uh, for a wide array of species. And so that's gonna tell us are these species doing good in a particular area? Uh, are they over time seeing uh, a decline in body condition? Uh, and that then allows us to understand better what's going on with the population. Do we need to you know, consider protecting certain habitat during the breeding or the non-breeding season and variables like that? And so, like I said, 
when we do the banding, we're collecting information on what species or subspecies, the age of the bird, the sex of the bird, when that can be uh, detected, uh, the mass, the wing length, and molt and feather condition, uh, which are both obviously very important because if you see a bird that's molting at a time that it shouldn't be, or it's, you know, it has bad feather condition uh, at a time when it should be molting in new feathers, that's going to tell us, okay, well, obviously there's some kind of nutritional deficiency in this population here, and we need to figure out why that is. And what you're seeing in, um, in this picture here is our um, misnet setup. Um, with our with our buckets here and a, a finely uh, meshed uh, net that that uh, under normal conditions, if it's not windy, we hope that the birds can't see that. Um, but as you can imagine, being on a grassland, any kind of wind will also cause the birds to see this net. But um, because we're we're still over over um, over a, a capped landfill, we're not allowed to puncture the ground. So you can see that we use our nets are held up with these buckets. But this is the apparatus that we typically use as we're, um, as we're banding birds. So at Fresh Kills, we started under um, Dr. Lisa Mann, who was my uh, PhD advisor at the College of Staten Island. Um, we started the MAPS banding station in 2016. Um, so this isn't, um, where the map station is, isn't part of the grassland birds that we're banding. This is more of a wooded swamp habitat. And you can see a northern cardinal here. Um, we get a lot of the typical species that you would find in this kind of habitat, uh, like northern cardinal, blue jay, um, yellow warbler. So we get quite a bit of diversity too in the species that we are, um, that, that come into our maps banding station. Um, so it gives us an idea of well, what birds are breeding at the park and also an idea of productivity. How well are uh, the birds doing? So in fact, we look at a lot of our hatchier birds as kind of this metric of um, how well the birds are breeding within the park itself. And what are we learning about our grassland birds that we're banding? Well, um, as it turns out, grassland birds are really hard to catch. As you can imagine, our, our mist net is only 12 meters in length. Um, and we have about 2,200 acres that we need to, uh, <laughs> that we need to cover. So um, banding grassland birds can be a, a hit or a miss. It's usually a miss, um, but we get an idea of productivity as well um, and site fidelity. I don't know, Jose, do you wanna talk about this, about the, the color banding and the birds coming back year after year? Sure, so as you can see on the right side uh, of the screen, we have a bird that has some, some, some fancy jewelry. Uh, this bird was banded uh, in, I want to say, July of this year, uh, and those are uh, colored plastic bands. And this is the first year that we've actually been able to do this. And so this actually allows us to identify individuals from a longer range as opposed to just attaching the standard aluminum uh, bands that we usually put on a bird. Um, we're also able to put these other bands and create a unique combination uh, to identify those birds from a, a, a longer distance. And what that allows us to do then is determine which individual birds are holding individual territories, uh, which birds belong to which nest, uh, as well as tell us if a bird is returning from year to year without necessarily having to recapture that bird. And so the bird on the left-hand side is a bird that Shannon and I banded in 2019 as a juvenile bird, a bird that was no more than three months old, uh, that returned to the exact same location to have its own nest uh, the next year. And so that was true for several of our birds, which tells us that they have what's called high site fidelity. They have a high affinity to the site, which tells us that this is a good quality habitat uh, that these birds want to continue to nest in. And so this is a project that we will continue to uh, run over the long term. Uh, and we hope to have a very long term and large data set on uh, grassland bird site fidelity in an urban environment. And, and this bird here is is a little bit funny because this bird was was recaptured the following year, I think within almost a couple meters, right? Yeah, it was in the same right? yeah, it was in the same same spot. spot. Yep. Um, so really quite remarkable that um, that they returned all the way this way to the park. But 
as Jose was mentioning, these color bands are really important for us so we don't have to recapture the bird. We want to see this bird and where it goes and um, how it spends its time in the park during the breeding season. So uh, here you can see, it's, a, it's not a great photo, but with binoculars, um, we're able to make out this individual bird with its color bands itself. And we are learning quite a bit about our birds here in an urban habitat, because ideally what we'd like to do is compare um, the data that we get to more natural grassland habitats and see if there's a difference between things like um, how long birds hold territories or how big the territory sizes are um, in an urban habitat versus more natural habitat. So um, we, we are getting bits and pieces. Again, as Jose mentioned, this is our first year that we did the color banding and what we found um, with a couple of our birds is that uh, the territories are actually held for most of the breeding season. We don't see a lot of turnover um, in terms of another bird coming and invading that territory. Um, but what's still to come is we'd really like to get a better idea of how large these territories are um, and how dense these how, uh, the density of territories that we have on site. So these are ongoing projects that um, we're really excited to continue in the future. And our, uh, our main attraction for the last two years. Uh, this is the Cedron. And I believe this is a photo that you took this year. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. That, so this is a bird that, uh, that has attracted a lot of attention. Uh, and it's something that we wish that we could share with more people. But unfortunately, because of uh, limitations to the site, uh, it has been hard to get uh, groups in to see them. Uh, but in New York State, at least, sedge wrens are one of our rarest breeding birds, and they are highly specialized, and they require uh, damp grasslands to breed. Um, and so at Fresh Kills, we have plenty of damp grasslands because of our uh, current uh, water management plan. Uh, a lot of the grasslands stay uh, pretty damp throughout the year, including in the winter, and they want tall grasses uh, and unfortunately for us, uh, sometimes display uh, little to no site fidelity. And so that makes our birds at Fresh Kills all the more interesting because we had them in 2020 and 2021, as Shannon will cover. Um, but one of the problems with studying Cedren is the fact that they're iterative breeders. So that means they're choosing sites at higher latitudes earlier in the breeding season. They're breeding or failing to breed and then coming back down later in the summer, really July, August, and September to then breed again or attempt to breed again. And so that allows, uh, allows us to have them uh, kind of at the right time when the grasses are tall enough uh, at fresh kills, when they're five to six feet tall. Uh, other times of the year, uh, the habitat wouldn't be as appropriate for them. Um, but overall, when researchers want to study a species like this using like breeding bird survey, which is generally how uh, the US Geological Survey um, estimates population size, it's very hard to do that at a latitude that's lower than, you know, say, uh, on Ontario and Canada, because they're not down here yet, because they're breeding at a higher latitude and then coming down to try to breed again. And so, like some of the other grassland birds that we study, uh, after the European uh, colonists came and, and essentially cleared all the land, uh, there was a lot of suitable habitat for these species. And so, they were able to expand their range from the Midwest into the East and then do really well. And then as reforestation has happened over the last 150 years or so, you see a contraction of their breeding range to the upper portion uh, of New York State into Ontario and Quebec uh, and back into the Midwest. And so that all aligns approximately when uh, when Staten Island lost our uh, Cedrons in the early 1940s uh, and when New York really started to lose them in the 1960s. And so Overall, this is a figure uh, from a paper that should be coming out very soon uh, that Shannon and I uh, wrote for Urban Naturalist. 
um, overall, they breed in very low numbers throughout New York State. And you can see that most of those uh, white dots are confined to the St. Lawrence Valley and the, uh, and the Ontario Plain. Uh, not all of these are necessarily breeders, but these are birds that were seen uh, sometime between June and September. And like I said before, uh, in New York City and on Long Island, they were extirpated as breeding birds in 1960, which is when the uh, when JFK Airport, uh, the planners for JFK Airport paved over the marshes and the upland areas that Cedrons were breeding uh, near Idlewild Park uh, in Queens. So um, we put together a bit of a timeline for our, our breeding Cedron. And as you can imagine, um, they first arrived uh, August 6th. And, and that is typically the end of our, what we would expect for, for arrivals for a breeding season. And uh, myself and, and Kate Field um, and Jose and I were, were um, out banding grasshopper sparrows for the end of the season. And we started hearing a, a sound that we weren't quite familiar with at Fresh Kills. And, you know, after working, uh, after, after working at Fresh Kills for, for a number of years, uh, anytime you hear something new, you know it's something exciting. So uh, we were just all kind of blown away uh, when a, a single bird almost approached our, our mist net. Um, it was a singing uh, Cedron male, and he came awfully close to us. So we got some pretty good views. That's the picture that you're seeing here was, um, here on the right was the first uh, bird to arrive. Um, and a few hours later, we heard a second singing male. So now we knew we were kind of on to something. And later on, a couple of days later, we, we started getting more singing males. So on the 12th of August, we observed uh, a sedron bringing nesting material to one of the nests. On August 14th, we confirmed three singing <coughs> birds in that location, all returning to individual nest sites. And um, I didn't see this, but Jose did because he's braver than I. At the end of the summer, I won't go into the grasses because you'll never find me again because um, the grass is over seven feet tall. Um, on September 16th, um, he confirmed our first fledgling, which was pretty remarkable. And by September 29th, we had three juveniles that were present and foraging within the area. And the last observation that we made in 2020 was on October 11th. So, um, you can see here from the map of Fresh Kills, here's East Mound. Um, so in 2020, they were on the southern end here in orange. Um, and true to their nature of not being, uh, not exhibiting high site fidelity, well, they, they did to an extent show uh, site fidelity this year, but they picked the all the way upper part of the park. So they really went to the opposite side of the park in a much uh, larger habitat. And they also showed up much earlier. So. Uh, we first confirmed Cedron this season on July 12th, and that was when the first Cedrons arrived, um, again, on the opposite side of the park. So they really wanted to uh, make our lives a little more difficult trying to find them because it's a lot of area to kind of cover uh, for Jose and I. And um, it's actually pretty remarkable because this year we had eight pairs of Cedron, which is, uh, which is pretty wild. So, um, and, and we did have confirmed uh, uh, fledglings and, and breeding activity. So for two years in a row, we were very lucky to have this amazing bird uh, come back to the park. So let's just all keep our fingers crossed for 2022 because we really um, enjoy having them come back. It's really pretty remarkable. Uh, so now we're gonna start talking about kind of our, our non-breeders uh, that have been coming to the park in increasing numbers. Uh, so first up is the Upland Sandpiper, which we've been seeing, uh, especially in 2021, we saw a whole bunch of them. I think we saw about seven or eight of them total uh, between spring and, and, and fall migration. Um, in 2015, we actually had a pair uh, on the uh, North Mound, which did not stay to breed, um, but we are certain that this, the site is overall a uh, suitable habitat for them. Uh, so it's very likely that at some point in the upcoming years, uh, we will once again have upland sandpipers breeding in New York City. Uh, after the last breeding pair at JFK, I want to say in 2010, it was, I think, more recent than people will realize uh, or give credit for. But we lost uh, upland sandpipers pretty recently, but hopefully we actually get them back at a couple sites uh, over the next couple decades. I keep trying to switch the thing myself like I'm teaching class. Um, 
and we <laughs> such a such a bad habit. Um, this is kind of our our more exciting uh, of all of the species that we've been getting as as uh, breeding site uh, prospectors. I should probably also explain what that means. So uh, the title of of these slides says uh, says breeding site prospecting, and that just means that you have uh, individual birds that are going to sites and collecting information for a successive breeding attempt. So you have individuals that are coming in, they're seeing high quality habitat, they might be seeing other species that are doing well, so more fledglings, uh, and then they're storing that information in their head, and then they're migrating or doing whatever they're going to do, and then they're coming back. And so, of course, we haven't confirmed that with Upland Sandpiper or Henslow Sparrow, uh, as I'm going to talk about now, um, but we're hopeful that this is what's occurring. And so in 2019 uh, and 2021, we had uh, multiple Henslow Sparrows on the East Mound at Fresh Coast Park in July and August, which is uh, quite a bit before you would expect them to occur as fall migrants. And so that's what's telling us that these birds are specifically searching out, looking for sites uh, to breed, uh, hopefully in the next year or potentially uh, thereafter. Um, and 2019 actually ended up being a pretty funny story because like our Cedron discovery, we were actually banding grasshopper sparrows uh, and the Henslow sparrow landed on top of our mist net, on top of the, the guy line that we used to hold down the mist net. Uh, so we never actually caught it, but we had really good, well, I, Shannon, uh, Shannon was actually trying to uh, chase birds into the net from the tall grasses, so I don't think she was able to see this one. Uh, but our, uh, our supervisor, Kate, was able to see it along with uh, myself. But in 2021, we were all uh, treated to some, some singing uh, Henslow sparrows and also some, some pretty good views. Uh, as well. And so this year we actually had a singing male Lacan sparrow uh, within our Cedren colony, which if you've ever seen Lacan sparrows during the breeding season, they're oftentimes associated with uh, Cedrens and, and Henslow sparrows, and all of them really like the same habitat. They're looking for damp grasslands uh, with pretty tall grasses. Um, and so this was very notable because this is a bird that showed up on August 24th and was singing, uh, which is not something that we tend to see in New York State in general. Uh, in fact, I think there's only been about two that have been found in the uh, around the breeding season, uh, one of which was on Staten Island in 1992, I believe, uh, in actually near Fresh Kills at Soil Mill Creek in a, a salt marsh sparrow colony, and also a, a bird in, I think, a little later in the 90s, maybe 1995 or so, uh, that was found way up north uh, in, uh, in, 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 I think, Jeff, no, uh, St. Lawrence, uh, also, uh, which remained for a whole month uh, during the breeding season, but also in that kind of damp grassland habitat. Uh, and it's a species that, like many other species, are potentially shifting their wintering range due to climate change. Um, so this, even if, you know, they don't breed, this tells us that maybe over time, they're going to become a more common wintering bird, um, which seems to be the case, actually. So um, we, we, we are having some really great successes with our grassland birds, but, but um, they do have obstacles that they face in an urban environment. Um, and they do have a couple different predators that we thought would be important to talk about, uh, one including the red fox. So red fox uh, began breeding at Fresh Hills Park in 2018, and they have done um, pretty well within the park. And by 2020, um, there are at least 10 families. And as of this year, there's probably about 20 families, and we find dens constantly. Um, so it could be more than that as well, because there's still a large part of the park um, on West Mound that, that we're not, we don't have access to. So uh, we are seeing this species really begin to prolifer proliferate quickly um, within the park itself. And, and that could be a problem for some of our ground nesting species, especially species like killdeer who tend to lay um, eggs in more obvious spots than things like our sparrows. So um, we've also seen with the rise of our red fox that we're also seeing a decline in our spotted sandpipers and our killdeer that are breeding at the park. Uh, for example, in 2018, we had over 30 pairs um, of both species nesting um, where they could within the park. And we had very, very little success after that. So um, what you're seeing here on top is a killdeer and here you're seeing a, a spotted sandpiper nest. And 
From 2019 to 2021, we've only had three pairs of spotted sandpiper um, and zero pairs of killed deer that have successfully nested. So um, it's kind of unfortunate because, um, you know, as much as we, we think red fox, they're very cute, but um, they're, they're also, they can, be, um, they can be harmful to some of our ground nesting birds as well. Jose, I'll let you talk about the deer. <laughs> uh, if you follow me on Twitter, you've definitely seen me say something about deer, uh, but I will be very professional tonight. Uh, so on Staten Island, uh, as I can tell you firsthand, uh, our population of white-tailed deer uh, is very large. And so, uh, believe it or not, uh, prior to 2011, there weren't a ton of them at all. Uh, in fact, if you saw a white-tailed deer on Staten Island, people would say, "Wow, what are you like? What are you seeing out there?" Because there's no way we've never seen a white-tailed deer. Well, uh, now they're everywhere, and they are. Uh, their population apparently is has slowed uh, uh, slightly because of uh, New York City's um, uh, castration program, uh, which, as you can see, we have a deer on the right here that has some. Uh, uh, a nice necklace, which is a radio collar, and it's also got two earrings. Uh, and this means uh, it's a male that has been um, uh, been part of the vasectomy program. Uh, and so this is a male that apparently cannot breed. And so, um, you know, this is a good thing. Obviously, we want to reduce the population because of overbrowsing, uh, where you have uh, the our favorite uh, white-tailed deer. Uh, moving across Staten Island and essentially eating all of the native vegetation and completely destroying our understory, which is very bad. Uh, but because of our uh, our measures, we have slowly been able to um, reduce the population uh, slightly. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't preclude uh, us from uh, the influx of males from outside of Staten Island, uh, which is exactly how deer got here over the past decade, where we have individuals that are moving across uh, both the Raritan Bay and also the Arthur Kill from New Jersey uh, and, and becoming part of our population. And so unfortunately at Fresh Hills, um, they are not just eating our native plants, they're also eating our grassland uh, and ground nesting birds in general. Um, and so they are what's called an opportunistic predator. So they're, yes, they tend to eat plant matter, uh, but when they're very hungry and they can't get their favorite food, uh, they will go out and they will make sure that they find whatever they can to eat. And unfortunately, that includes uh, both young birds and adult birds, as well as eggs. And so that is something that we've actually seen uh, at Fresh Kills, but have yet to quantify uh, in any meaningful way. Um, you know, we're in the process of actually assessing our population within the park. It seems that uh, in the winter, it's larger than it is during uh, the breeding season, which is a good thing because that just means they're congregating in the winter and then spreading out during the breeding season. And they're not all in one place to eat all of our uh, grassland birds, but it's bad news for other parts of Staten Island. And so this is uh, this is something that we wanted to start this year, but COVID kind of restricted us uh, in ways that we didn't really expect, uh, as well as the uh, fosters turns not uh, breeding in a spot where we could really access them easily. Uh, so this year we were actually supposed to start uh, fosters turn banding at Fresh Kills Park. Fresh Kills is one of the only two uh, locations in New York City where fosters turn breed. Uh, the other is uh, Joko Marsh, which uh, I, I hope Don Reefy is in the chat somewhere. Uh, he was one of the, the first people that actually found the breeding uh, in, in New York, uh, in New York City, in Jamaica Bay. Uh, and so essentially what we were hoping to do uh, was, like other turns, uh, common turns uh, in New York City are also banded, we were hoping to mark our foster turns at Fresh Hills Park uh, with maroon uh, plastic color bands, which have uh, a unique combination of letters and numbers. Uh, that you, as an observer, can read in the field and report to the bird banding lab or report to us uh, so we can get an idea of where our Fresh Kills birds are going, what habitat they're using, uh, and we want to expand that to what they're eating uh, and when they're where they're going uh, during the non-breeding season because we are actually kind of uh, the northern limit of their, their uh, range, so uh, their thermal tolerances might be different than individuals at the core of the range, uh, kind of south of us. Um, so it would be obviously very interesting to see if our fosters turns are the ones that are 
overwintering in southern New Jersey as opposed to overwintering somewhere south of there. Um, and this will be the first uh, New York State Foster's Turn specific study, uh, as far as we know, uh, and certainly the first banding study. So that makes it pretty exciting as well. Uh, another thing that we are also um, uh, studying, which isn't necessarily uh, birds, but has a lot to do with birds, is some arthropod sampling, because it's also important to know um, the diet of the birds and, and um, as an important resource for birds on our grassland. And um, I'll let Jose expand a little bit more on the American bird grasshopper, because that's a really neat um, species that we've had colonize the park. But um, arthropod diversity is very important indicator of ecosystem health. So it's important that we get an idea of what's in the park and kind of get an inventory in that way. And um, in the Northeast, um, in Northeastern North America, many arthropod families have not been inventoried in a very long time. So. Uh, we're trying to get a really good handle on this and get an idea of the species that are breeding in the park. And um, we're finding some pretty interesting, um, interesting things as we go along, including um, the American bird grasshopper, which I'll let Jose explain a little bit more, but that's the species you're seeing up here. Uh, so uh, Shannon and I, while we study grass and birds, um, what we've done our graduate work on is the uh, distribution of species under climate change. And although most of our species at Fresh Kills, this doesn't apply to, uh, this certainly applies to our, uh, our new breeding species, the American bird grasshopper. Uh, climate change is obviously something that we have to think about in all aspects of our life, but with species distributions, we're seeing a whole bunch of different things happening. But one of the best ways that we know that climate change is affecting species is that they're tracking uh, the their thermal niche. And so perfect example is the American bird grasshopper, which historically was distributed throughout the southern United States, and it's now creeping northward. And this is a pattern that we're seeing across a whole lot of species, including uh, Northern Cardinal, which we now have in New York, but previously was a, a really rare bird in, in New York City uh, into the into the early uh, 1900s. Um, and so uh, American bird grasshoppers are, are kind of no different uh, from them. Uh, we in 2020 documented the first breeding by the species in northeastern North America uh, at Fresh Kills. Um, there is another site in actually in Pennsylvania, uh, in, in central Pennsylvania, that also uh, has a, a breeding population of, of bird grasshopper uh, that they both started breeding at around the same time. Um, but this actually happened over the course of about 200 years where you had individuals uh, during their non-breeding phase flying very long distances, hundreds of kilometers uh, as vagrants, like like our, our, you know, we're all kind of birders, I'm assuming. Uh, many of us are birders. We're all looking for vagrants. Um, Bird grasshoppers were like other birds uh, that we would uh, normally see in Central Park, vagrants. They're coming this long way and then, you know, historically they were probably mostly dying. Um, but now as climate has become more suitable for them, they've actually started to breed and establish here. Uh, and so now American bird grasshoppers are seen throughout the year, even on warm days in the winter. Uh, whereas historically they would not have been able to survive the winter because they had this lower thermal tolerance uh, and and yeah sorry my uh, my chat just went over the the screen but anyway that's the gist of of American bird grasshoppers but um, very much uh, an interesting occurrence uh, at fresh kills uh, and very much uh, due to climate change and um, th this grasshopper. Uh... American bird grasshopper that you're seeing here was the first one to be seen. And um, I, we, we can't really take credit for being the first to find it. We actually were hosting a class that was interested in doing a tour at Fresh Kills and that they, they pointed out this grasshopper and they were like, well, what is this? And Jose and I looked at each other. It's like, oh, well, that's new to us. Um, and they're interesting in, in that um, when they breed at high densities, they tend to have a different color. So in high densities, um, their instars tend to be more red in color. So uh, this is this one here is a bit red, a bit orange. So we know that that at least in 2020 that this was a species that was kind of breeding in this spot in pretty high densities, which I thought was um, 
pretty interesting, but they're very hard to miss. They're very large grasshoppers. They're how many inches? The largest in North America. They're, I think they're over five inches long. They're like, they're over five. They're like, we, we see them as we're driving in the park and, and they're kind of hard to miss because they'll fly right by the window. So um, a very neat uh, species that we've acquired here at Fresh Kills Park. Um, so we spent all this time talking about the park and um, I know the park isn't yet open to the public and it makes it a little bit frustrating if you want to come in and see birds, but I promise you there are ways to get involved and to get in touch and, and um, different opportunities. Um, if you visit our website at freshkillspark.org. Uh, we do offer kayak tours, nature walks, and photography for uh, photography tours. So uh, sign up for the mailing list and you'll you'll be the first to hear about it. Um, we also take art and research inquiries as well. Um, we, we also will conduct class trips and tours um, and also student-led research. Now, um, in, in terms of we can't take individuals to the park, we don't have the staffing or the capacity to do that. Um, so these are different avenues in which you can get involved with the park and, and come join us um, when, when these things are open to the public. And um, we do have a part of the park that is uh, going to be open, uh, part of North Park. Uh, sometime, hopefully in the spring of 2022, don't quote me on the time because we know with COVID, a lot of things have just um, have, have taken have taken time. So we don't have a date yet, but this is going to be um, part of the park that's going to have a, um, a bike lane and it's going to have a bird tower that overlooks the marsh and it's really um, quite, quite pretty. So um, hopefully you get to use that part of the park very soon. So um, with that being said, here is a grasshopper sparrow singing and we are happy to take any questions. Well, hey, that was great. Um, I have to say, I really want some deer earrings. And I can't stand the cuteness of the grasshopper sparrow when you're holding it. Um, there are so many sparrows. I think we're gonna need a sparrow ID class. Um, I had the great privilege to join John Reapy um, on a trip to Chincoteague over the past weekend and um, trying to distinguish savannah sparrows and salt marsh sparrows and song sparrows. And, and uh, there are some sparrow ID classes that we offer through the year that are definitely worth taking if you uh, wanna, wanna learn how to distinguish all of your, your many sparrows. Um, I also wanna say that I had the great um, honor to be part of a task force that Laura Trutner, who's manager of uh, park development put together a few years ago to talk about opening the park. Um, and and uh, spring 2022 can't come fast enough, but uh, if it's delayed, it, you know, it's all for good reasons. Um, but there are really good questions to solve. What about restrooms? What about parking? What about public transit? How do people get water, especially on hot days? Um, what about park safety and viewing platforms? So all of the things that we talked about a few years ago um, you're even mentioning them makes me very happy. Uh, benches and, and little uh, cutouts so that people can get safely to water's edge through reeds and tall grass and things like that. Um, I can't imagine people wandering through uh, seven foot high grass looking for birds. That just can't, can't be, so it wouldn't be safe. So I'm very excited um, and hoping that Discovery Days will come back, which was twice a year the park would be open to the public and New York City Audubon among, among others would, would come out and table and leap bird walks um, that were very, very well attended. And um, so I know there's a lot of enthusiasm for the park. Um, I'm gonna start with the first question um, and someone had, had put into the Q&A a question about coyote. Um, and I don't think coyote are, are appropriate predators for deer. Um, they eat a lot of, uh, rabbits and uh, rodents and things, but have you, have you seen coyotes in the park? So we don't currently have a population of coyotes uh, anywhere in Staten Island that we know of. Um, coyotes have been seen on Staten Island. Um, it's not going to be anywhere near enough to affect our deer population. Um, so that's kind of where we stand on that. Um, and, yeah, I think managing with birth yeah. control is probably the, 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 better, the better route to take um, to try to, to, to 
keep those numbers reasonable. And um, are you also seeing turkeys, which we hear are quite overrunning Staten Island these days, even though we're approaching Thanksgiving? <laughs> yeah, they should all be hiding. Uh, yeah, we, uh, <laughs> we, we do get the occasional uh, flock of uh, turkey coming into the park and hanging out um, by the visitor center. We've gotten some nice looks at them there. We don't see them very, um, very frequently, though, but uh, they do like to make their presence known when they are there. Yeah. Oh, I bet they do. Um, so let's see, we have a question here. Can you describe the process of catching and banning the birds? I guess the mist net process and what you do and how you release them. Yeah, so um, before we even talk about the process of catching and banding the birds, um, I should mention that it's a highly regulated activity. It's regulated by the U.S. Geological Survey. So in order to capture a bird legally uh, and handle them and band them, you have to have what's called a, a master banding permit. And so that's issued to uh, scientists and, and generally only scientists. There are some uh, bird banders that do uh, other activities where they band in there in, in backyards and, and you know they band... Uh, um, hummingbirds and, and whatnot, um, but ge in general, it's mostly people that are, are conducting scientific research. Uh, and well, all, all banding has to have a research question. Um, so in our case, uh, we have uh, a permit to band all passerines and near passerines. So those are all the perching birds and all the woodpeckers and uh, among other things, American woodcock. Um, and so that allows us to erect mist nets, which we showed a picture of on one of the slides. Um, and so basically what we do is we put these mist nets up and these are very difficult for the birds to see. And so uh, at least for grassland birds, we generally make them in a V pattern and that funnels the birds into the net um, and they're captured and we remove them very carefully uh, from the mist nets and only uh, Shannon and I uh, and Dick Veet are allowed to remove birds from nets because we're all uh, bird banders, we're all permitted through uh, the U.S. Geological Survey. And so um, we remove them um, and we measure their wings, we weigh them, and then we carefully place an aluminum band uh, on their leg. Um, and again, we're very careful in doing this. We don't want to close the band on the leg. Um, and so uh, all the birds that we have captured uh, go uninjured, uh, and that's kind of a testament to uh, kind of, you know, they don't just give these permits to anybody. You have to be, you have to have a lot of experience. And, and Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. so. Um, it's a very quick process, too. Um, yeah. So we, we, we try to keep it as quick as possible, all of our banders do, keep it as quick and as stress-free on the animal as possible. Um, so it, it's done very quickly. The bird um, hits the net and um, it, it's done in rapid time. We already know the data that we're going to collect. We've seen these birds um, hundreds of times. So, so it's a quick process and we send the bird along on its way. And now with the color bands, we can view them from afar and make sure they're doing okay throughout the breeding season. Okay. Um, we have a question about, uh, can New York City Parks relocate red foxes to save the birds and i think no. that that's an interesting question because um one of the bits of evidence that that the work that's being done to uh rehabilitate uh wetlands and forest areas and all of the natural areas around the city is that the wildlife is coming back and um so you know i don't know that relocating is going to keep them away but Got some thoughts on that, or are there are there efforts underway to try to use some birth control measures for the fox? Yeah, no. So the the foxes are very very new. So that's all within the last few years. Um, they were always on Staten Island in in low very low densities, uh, but now they are in extremely high densities, and that kind of coincides with their proliferation in New Jersey. Uh, mm -hmm. None of which is good. So yes, they are returning to uh, our our parks. Uh, it's, it is not necessarily a good thing. Um, they are unregulated predators, which is uh, not so great. However, um, they are cool and it's, it's a good thing for research purposes. We're gonna now uh, get to kind of see what happens uh, over time in our, in our 
uh, grassland bird colonies. Uh, hopefully that doesn't uh, induce any negative uh, interactions, but you know we're kind of seeing, uh, like with un other unmitigated uh, predators, um, you know that that is obviously a problem. Um, so to answer the question about relocating, you definitely cannot relocate them. So you don't want to relocate foxes. You don't want to relocate uh, deer. Uh, and why could that be? Well, if they're bad here, then they will also be bad elsewhere. And so that you means that, <laughs> yeah, you 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 overload you you will overload an ecosystem with uh, with predators, which. Uh, isn't a good thing. We, it, you know, if, when you study ecological theory, you know that predators tend to be naturally at lower abundances than prey, uh, than, than than prey species. And so, on Staten Island, just actually just at Fresh Hills alone, we have over 20 families of foxes, um, and that is a lot of foxes. And so, uh, overall, you're putting more pressure on uh, other species. Uh, and we don't, we really don't want that. And so uh, if we don't want that, we also don't want to then relocate those species and have them uh, proliferate elsewhere. We want to slow that down. Uh, you know, unfortunately, they weren't really able to do that in, in, in parts of New Jersey. And, and now people are feeding them in the backyards. Uh, and you see that in other cities too, urban foxes. And, you know, if, if, if you're old enough to remember, and I actually, I'm not old enough to remember this, but if some, some of you must be old enough to remember uh, what happened to the colonial waterbird colonies on Long Island when red foxes were allowed to proliferate? Uh, we yeah. lost uh, we lost a whole lot of species on Long Island because of that. Uh, common terns, rosia terns, we lost entire colonies uh, out on on the on the uh, on the South Shore. So it's a uh, it, it's a problem that that uh, that we will need to think about uh, coming in the coming years, especially. Well, I have two more questions, um, and I just wanted to say, you know, maybe the foxes will help us with the feral cat population. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, <laughs> hang the mice in the trees, you solve one problem, and you create another problem, and you create another problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one question here is the variety of is the variety of grassland plant species remaining stable, or are you seeing encroachment? by Phragmites and mugwort and perhaps other invasives? Great question. Yeah, we, we, we get quite a bit of, of the mugwort and Phragmites and um, unfortunately it, it's just a lot to manage and, and it is starting, it, it is encroaching um, in, in some of the, the native, uh, the native um, grasses that have been planted. Unfortunately, it's just, again, um, the, these invasive species just have this wild ability to just uh, move in very, very quickly and do very well. So unfortunately, it is a, a um, an issue that we do have at the park and elsewhere in other parks um, in Staten Island and New York as well. Yeah, no, our, our that... real problem at Fresh Kills is Chinese bush clover, uh, which is Ooh, really, right. it's really proliferating in you can't rip our, it and you can't do anything about it. It's, it's, it's a problem. It's a big problem. Yeah. The mile so a minute. What, ask about the lantern fly. Yeah. Are you seeing the lantern fly in the park? Yeah. So, yeah, lantern fly um, was first documented in Staten Island um, in August of 2020. It, this year, uh, lantern fly was recorded in all of the boroughs. And I imagine right. that. Um, so on Staten Island, they're they're everywhere. They're they're almost in every park. They're in every yard. We get hundreds of them um, on our trees. Um, you really can't escape them. They hitchhike on cars, um, on our windshields. That they, they they are are um, they are really all over the place. And the problem is now that we're seeing them in all the other boroughs. I imagine if it's following the same pattern as it has in Staten Island, that this is going to become much more widespread. So it's just. And because we're such a solution. Yeah, I have a solution. First graders. First graders with, with heavy shoes and clubs and mallets. And we'll, yeah, we'll it, them because there's sort of an unlimited supply every year of first graders. We just get them out there with mallets and say, kill, kill, kill. A mechanistic kill. way. <laughs> we'll say. Mechanistic way. Oh, but you know, we, we are <laughs> mindful too is, is that there is this weird um, research opportunity that's kind of presenting itself here though because um, we're, we're actually not seeing them on trees that they 
that they're found in Pennsylvania, they like the tree of heaven, the Atlantis uh, trees, we're finding them um, on all sorts of different species and, and they don't seem to have that preference. So um, it, it's interesting that um, we're, we're seeing this with an invasive species going on um, dogwoods and cottonwoods and other species. Um, so it, it is an interesting opportunity to kind of research why, why are we seeing them on different species here um, than in other parts of where they've invaded. So yeah, um, and I've uh, heard some birds have been shown to eat them, but not enough, nowhere near what we would, and, and they're not natural here, so they're not their natural food, it's too bad. Um, yeah. now you mentioned that the amount, uh, here's another, my last question, because we really are, um, we're after eight, and we're gonna let you all go, but, um, talking about the amount of grassland in the Northeast um, now is much less than before. And I think some of the recent studies showed that grassland habitat was in the, at the greatest risk um, and, and um, least abundant. And can you talk a little bit about that? And then I'll come back and, and wrap us up. Sure. V very briefly, um, when I mentioned that grasslands were are, are, are much uh, much less abundant uh, as they were pre-European settlement. Uh, so Native Americans uh, managed grassland habitat essentially uh, for a long time before European settlement. Uh, so I should just mention that, uh, but the Europeans just cleared everything. They cleared everything with no regard for uh, natural resources, unlike uh, the, native, uh, the native people. Uh, and so um, because of that, uh, there was a lot more suitable habitat for more species, and so they were allowed. They were able to move in. Uh, so species like grasshopper sparrows, which you know probably uh, you know many hundreds of years ago weren't necessarily uh, grassland obligate uh, as they are now, uh, they were allowed to proliferate in this grassland habitat, which they've now become uh, highly specialized for. Uh, so, but Shannon, you can take the rest. Take the rest of that. Oh, I, th I thought you did. <laughs> that was great. Um, you know, the thing is, is that um, grassland birds just in general are just the most imperiled guild and, and across the board, a lot of our grassland birds because of this land use change have really declined over time. Um, and, and what's interesting about Fresh Kills Park, at least what, what I think is interesting is, is how quickly grasses can grow, given the opportunity, um, particularly in urban habitats. So uh, we're, we're not creating more grassland than what's being destroyed, but what's interesting is that we're able to create a habitat. Grassland birds require large uh, swaths of continuous grassland habitat. And um, the, the fact that we can see these kind of successes with these birds moving in, these highly specialized birds and a highly specialized habitat in New York City is just pretty, uh, pretty amazing. It kind of gives us hope that maybe there are other conservation strategies down the line that we can um, kind of help the, this imperiled guild. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I think someone had asked about Idlewild, and I think we were talking about the upland sandpipers um, that were last seen uh, breeding in, in that area, you know, and, and it's interesting that the Shirley Chisholm State Park, uh, which was the, the Pennsylvania Avenue and Fountain Avenue landfills that have been capped um, and are also, you know, large open habitat and, and trying to look at what's happening there. Um, with that, with that grassland um, and uh, Floyd Bennett Field, and and looking at these areas and and making sure the mowing schedules um, are conducive to to supporting these bird populations. Um, of course, we don't want to encourage lots of birds near the airports, but um, we really do we really do want want to see um, more appropriate habitat of all different types, so grassland and and wetland and salt marsh and freshwater wetland salt marsh. Um, and whatever we can do. And, and this is all part of this, this sort of um, 40, 50 years of really hard work toward clean air, clean water and, and better habitat and our city moving towards um, green buildings with green roofs or solar or bird friendly um, design, which is now required in the city and it took a lot of lobbying and, and looking at what we, what we could do about light pollution and all the other things that make this is a much better place for wildlife. We also then have to be prepared for the wildlife to show up and that includes the foxes and, and being able to manage their numbers um, when things do show up because it isn't, it isn't fully a natural habitat in balance. We're trying to create and replicate that balance. Um, 
but that's part of being the greatest city on earth. Um, we, we have communities really committed to this and um, we have, have community organizations, whether they're citywide like New York City Audubon um, or uh, Pine Barrens or, or other, other groups that are, that are all around our city focused on very local issues um, or, or broader issues. And it's, it's really, really exciting um, to, see, to see the evidence that, that, that the wildlife is coming back as a result of the work that um, New York City Audubon and its members and many other groups across the city have been doing um, since the real call to action um, and the, the legislation of the early 70s. So um, I'm thrilled to see the two of you, um, Shannon, with your PhD, um, Jose, uh, working on yours, um, really being the future of conservation in, in the urban environment in our city. And it's just exciting to be a part of it. And I'm so, so grateful to you for sharing it with our, our membership and everyone Thank else. You. And, and um, we had quite the crowd tonight. So I'm really, um, I'm really thrilled. And uh, Danielle's put back in the chat. I'll leave it up for a minute. Um, the registration for the next lecture, which is Birdopedia on December 6th. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, it's really been, been a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I hope to see you on the 6th.